Join Dr. Richard Okoye every Sunday by 3.30 p.m. A very warm welcome to you, everyone. This is Politics Tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I am Ola Jumoke Olatunji. The National Judicial Council, at its 106th meeting, has recommended Justice Kudirat Kekereekun to President Bola Tinubu for appointment as the Chief Justice of Nigeria. Tonight, our focus is on the moves federal government is taking to address food inflation. And our guests are Dr. Olukayode Oyeleye, an Greek business analyst, and Omori Edugiawari, a startup business lawyer and also a financial analyst. Welcome to the program, everyone. Stay with us. I'll be right back. Thank you very much for staying with us. Now let's begin with some developments in the polity. The National Judicial Council at its 106th meeting presided over by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Olukayo Dariwola, has recommended Justice Kudirat Kikereakun to President Bola Tinubu for appointment as the Chief Justice of Nigeria. Justice Ariwola will be retiring on the 22nd of August after the retainment of 70 years. CBC News Senior Reporter takes a look at the process of nomination of a Chief Justice, its long-standing tradition, and who will fill the shoes of Justice Ariwola. It is a common saying in law that there must not be a vacuum. As one Chief Justice of Nigeria leaves, another is recommended and nominated. Justice Olukayo de Ariwola was born on 22nd August 1954. On 22nd November 2011, he was appointed to the bench of the Supreme Court of Nigeria. Ariwola Olukayo de, do solemnly swear that I will be faithful and be a true allegiance. He was appointed substantive Chief Justice of Nigeria on 27th July 2022. <laughs> Following the resignation of Chief Justice Tanku Mohammed, as he then was, and formally confirmed Chief Justice by the Nigerian Senate on 21st September 2022. The tradition has always been the second in line, which succeed the outgoing CJN. There has never been an upset when it comes to succession to the office of the Chief Justice of Nigeria. The Federal Judicial Service Commission will nominate two names to the National Judicial Council for recommendation to the President. The names will be placed under priority and reserved. The priority will be the name of the second person in line, while the reserved will be the third person in line. The most preferred candidate is placed under priority, and if there is a reason why such a candidate cannot be recommended, the reserved candidate will then be considered. In this case, Justice Kudirat K. Kereakun is the second in line among the justices of the Supreme Court to succeed Justice Olukayode Ariwola. Her name will be placed in priority while the third in line, Justice Iyang John Okoro, will be placed on reserved. The committee responsible for screening and recommendation of judges is chaired by the second in line. In this instance, Justice Keke Reekung, being the second in line, cannot chair the committee that would oversee her screening. The chairmanship position moves to the third in line. Justice Iyang John Okoro, who will also be screened, cannot also chair the committee as he is a reserve candidate. The chairmanship position then goes to the third in line, which is Justice Uwani Musa Abaji. If this age long tradition is followed, Justice Kudirat K. Kereekung will become the next Chief Justice of Nigeria and the second female Chief Justice Nigeria will have after Justice Aluma Moria Muta. The first female Chief Justice of Nigeria was sworn in on 16th July 2012 by former President Kulok Jonathan as the 13th Indigenous Chief Justice of Nigeria and conferred on her Nigerian National Honor of the Grand Commander of the Order of the Niger. 
She was the Chief Justice of Nigeria from July 2012 to November 2014. Celestina Iria, TVC News, Abuja. There's been an improvement in crude oil production in the wake of renewed efforts of security agencies to curb crude theft and pipeline vandalism. Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, who disclosed this, said security forces will sustain the offensive to shore up oil production. Sifon SN reports. It's another opportunity for the military authorities to provide updates on operations across the country. Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, provides the details according to the activities in the various theaters. During the week under review, troops neutralized 147 terrorists and arrested 381 of them. We also arrested 23 perpetrators of oil theft and rescued 113 kidnapped hostages during the period under review. As for crude oil production, he says there's been a substantial improvement in output. According to the military, crude oil production has increased as a result of its renewed effort in curbing illegal bunkering and pipeline vandalism. Already we have recorded noticeable increase, improvement in the nation's crude oil production. And this is indicative of the fact that we are on the right track, but we are not going to rest on our oars. We are going to push forward. We are going to sustain the momentum until the nation's crude oil production quota, OPEC quota, is reached. The efforts are beginning to show results with Nigeria's crude output recently increasing from 1.2 million barrels per day to 1.61 million barrels per day. The federal government is now targeting 2.2 million barrels per day. While progress is being made, the battle against crude oil theft and pipeline vandalism is far from over. Sifon ACN, TVC News, Abuja. Let's take a short break and when we return, it will be time for tonight's conversation. Please stay with us, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. The reduction in the prices of gari, milk, and other items pushed Nigeria's food inflation to fall by 39.53% uh, in July 2024, from 40.87% in June of the same year. This is according to the report released by the National Bureau of Statistics, July Consumer Price Index, and Inflation Date. Uh, also, the federal government has set up an Agriculture and Water Resources Joint Action Committee to address uh, the challenges of food security and inflation. The Minister of State for Agriculture, Senator Ali of July, disclosed that uh, this at the National Youth Convention on Thursday in Abuja. The convention was organized by the Nigerian Women for Agriculture Progressive and Development Initiative. In view of this, uh, let's speak with Dr. Lukayode Oyeleye. He's an agri business analyst and he joins me live in the studio. And joining us virtually tonight is Omori Edogiawiri, a startup business lawyer and is also a financial analyst. Gentlemen, good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us on Politics Tonight. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. So, Omori, good evening to you, sir. Good evening. How are you? I'm very good. good. Thank you. So, let's start this conversation from the studio. Uh, at 40.87%, uh, food inflation reaches highest level in 25 years. But now that we have this figure uh, reduced to 39.53%, how much progress have we made? Well, uh, it's an evidence of some progress. Uh, uh, but what I would say is that um, it's not uh, a reason for um, relaxing or resting on our oars, as it were, uh, because um, we're talking about um, figures here on paper. Uh, but in reality, uh, in the market and in homes, um, has this actually reflected uh, so much? You know, that's one area we need to look at. And then one has to also understand the fact that um, this is um, a season. Ordinarily, it's a season of harvest. At about this time of the year, it's expected that the prices of food will go down drastically because of new 
uh, farm products, particularly you have yams, you have uh, corn, you have some other staples coming out about this time. And another reason why um, we must not rest on our oars is that uh, since uh, early July, there has been this uh, extended dry spell uh, running into the sixth week now. And it's a real cause for concern because uh, when all the chips are down, um, the product of harvest that might eventually come out of the farms may not, uh, uh, they may, they may not really reflect the reality of what probably had been projected as um, you know, uh, the end product during the harvest, uh, at the end of the harvest season, because a lot of uh, 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 farms now are devastated because of the drought. Many crops you know, withered on the field, and uh, just before coming to this place, I was looking at some pictures of some farmers, you know, lamenting right on their farms. And uh, there's a particular woman that was weeping, you know, right on her farm. And all of these are as a result of what people planted and drought destroyed them. And so um, uh, uh, losses as a result of drought are likely to be very high this year. So that's North what you and mean by extended dry spell? Yes, because naturally... Annually, what we used to call the August break should not last beyond just about 10 days to 15 days. But well, this one has lasted now, you know, it actually started from early July. Okay. So it has entered the sixth week now. So, and for that reason, um, it has really destroyed many crops that are like corn that are supposed to uh, be ready for harvest. Now, many of them couldn't really make it because they've dried on the farm and some other uh, crops as well. But generally, when you look at, uh, I mean, addressing food inflation, yes. is it really a hard nut to crack? Uh, it's, um, it's a bit of a hard nut to crack, uh, especially when you look at the dynamics of uh, uh, population and production. And then, of course, um, when, we, when you also think about a lot of things happening in a country like in Nigeria, for instance, where a lot of what we produce uh, particularly, let's take grain for an example. A lot of the grains we produce in this country actually end up outside Nigeria. Uh, if you go to places like um, Kano, for instance, a major market, which is about the biggest in West Africa there, uh, that is there were no markets. A lot of what we produce actually go out. And the forces of demand and supply actually also affect the prices. So depending on what experiences the uh, countries that are coming to Nigeria to, to buy, are, you know, are going through, uh, the, the, the demand, the pressure on what we have here might also cause prices of uh, what is harvested in Nigeria to increase. And the same goes with some other points, like if you go to Jigawa State, like Megateri, or you go to the Northwest, like Ilela, and um, uh, if, or maybe like Maradi, or if you go towards the Northeast, like around the Adamawa State, Gori, or a little bit northern part of the east, northeast of the country, like Banki. All of these places are places through which a lot of uh, agricultural products actually exit the country. And they are basically informal trades. We really don't have records of that. So if we're working you know, on uh, what is on the paper, for instance, these are some of the confounding variables that we are really not taking into consideration and can make a mockery of whatever you know, uh, we are looking at on paper. All right, we'll come back to that. Mr. Mori, let me bring you into this conversation because uh, in July, the federal government announced about six strategies in total. Uh, first is, is the 150-day duty-free import window for food commodities, and that covers suspension of duties, uh, tariffs, and taxes for the importation of certain food commodities through land and sea borders. We've also heard the minister say these commodities include maize, husk, brown rice, Wheat, cowpeas, and ported food commodities will be subjected to a recommended retail price. First, uh, does this demonstrate a clear understanding of this complex matters on ground? Well, it shows that the government is listening to expert advice. Um, you know, Jim okay, that we've had this conversation before. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I said was this is the kind of subsidy intervention that we need and subsidization that we need, which is going to the root cause and trying to see how you address those issues as against um, giving stipends that are not sustainable and will only just dissipate resources. If you look at the revenue that customs is going to be, uh, for want of better language, losing as a result of these waivers, it's over 188 billion. 
And, you know, if government were to share that in 50, 50,000 or 10,000, they'll tell you oh, they've reached how many homes, but how do you gauge that impact? So I think that it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's coming a bit late, but better late than never. And the intentionality of the products. Um, rice is a staple meal in every home in Nigeria, no matter how you, you paint it. Beans is also one. Uh, wheat. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, play a very pivotal role. So this cuts across rice, bread, beans, and the likes. Uh, maybe they should find a way to subsidize cassava <laughs> so that Gary can also come down more. Um, but on a more serious note, um, this is very important that this is done. But I have, a, I have a concern, and which lies in the implementation. Because we're hearing, oh, there'll be a list of importers, there'll be a list of accredited people who will be able to import. Implementation has always been a pivotal problem in this part of the world, um, where policies, no matter how altruistic they appear, get hazied up and messed up in implementation. Um, you also now begin to see issues of nepotism, issues of um, different sentiments begin to come to play in deciding those who will be in the forefront of, the, of this active implementation. So government will be very intentional. This policy will be useless if implementation is fretted away. Um, and I think that if you want to throw open the windows, throw it open. Let's let this place be flooded with food yeah. first. And I think that must be the pivotal concern of government at this time to crash the prices at any means possible. Uh, because if you now begin to pick those who will benefit from this waiver, um, what happens to uh, the others? Um, secondly, uh, we also have to look intentionally at the backward integration aspect, right? Because um, one of the requirements is that some of these exporters must have plans in place for backward integration. And what does that mean? Um, essentially building capacity to now produce these products locally. Um, and the, uh, the challenges we've had with indigenous manufacturing and indigenous production of food, the doctor and the audience may be able to corroborate what I'm saying, um, is uh, certain infrastructural challenges that oftentimes go beyond the businesses and the manufacturers themselves. Issues of power, insecurity, um, access to road networks, logistics supply chain, and access to credit. These are key issues that continue to stifle indigenous production. So I don't think that um, making backward integration a, a, a pivotal requirement for assessing this or being listed among the exporters who would be uh, able to import these products at no rate um, should be a key incentive because government in itself has a key role to play to ensure that these companies are able to adequately integrate, are able to adequately produce locally in such a way that we will reduce reliance on export. export. But it's a good start. It's a good way to show government's intention of making food affordable. Now, hungry, now a hungry man is an angry man. Now, who job better food? They talk principle. Right now, people just need to eat. And it's important that we flood the market with food. The only way the prices of food can come down is if there is enough food in the market. And when there's enough food in the market, competition sets in. When competition sets in, people shoot down their prices to be able to sell. Mm. If you don't have enough in the market, there is absolutely no way the prices will come down. All right. So, so Mr. Murray, let price... me take it up from there. Yeah. What then do you think we need to do within this 150-day period to give us some security after the window is over? Like I said last time, um, government must declare a state of emergency in our agri-sector. Agri and there must be a clear fusion of technology and the manual development, right? Uh, doctor was talking about rain and droughts affecting um, uh, harvest. And, and that's because we continue to rely heavily on natural happenstance. Um, we're in a world of technology. Technology is a moving train, and we have got to come on board fully. And one of the important things that we need to look at is to 
be able to mitigate from all these natural challenges with technological innovations. We can be battling a food challenge, and water is the reason why we don't have um, uh, proper harvest. When every day we're having dams overflowing and we're having uh, uh, places being flooded, right? We must now begin to look at you know utilizing technology and mechanized farming to be able to bridge this gap. Secondly, we have arable land. Travel from here to Benin, and then you see in the amount of bush and land. Government must begin to designate um, agriculture development zones where people are free to go there, get land, can farm and produce with the support of government, right? So let's put the land we have to our land mass is good, right? The issue of insecurity continues to be a challenge and the emphasis government has continued to be intentional about it. But we must now look at where are the areas in this country where these types of food are produced in large quantity. Do we beef up the security in these areas? Do we address the societal or community issues that have led to um, the insecurity in these areas so as to ensure that people can freely uh, farm and harvest their products and, ex and export to other parts or transport to other parts of the country, right? So this 100 and something days intervention must be full swing. A state of emergency in the agricultural sector must, as a matter of emergency, be declared so that what we're doing in this shortfall, because it's not sustainable for customs not to uh, charge import duty on this product. It's not even sustainable for us to continue to be importing. So if we don't want this 188 billion to just go to waste, we must now intentionally support in improved indigenous production so that when these tariffs return, it will be back to the problem. There would be local products to be able to compete with exported products, and the market will not feel the the heat of um, the removal of that. Because right. what we have seen in this country have been a a an, an an overt reliance on subsidization. We subsidize everything. We continue to subsidize, and so when subsidy is removed, it's as if the carpet has been pulled off our feet. However, where you create sustainable, an emphasis on the word, sustainable frameworks in place to ensure that people are able to adequately function even with the tariffs in place, then you would not have the outcry that we have, right? So declare it of emergency, um, support indigenous production. Let, let you know manufacturers have come out to say, look, that any further increase in interest rates is going to be disastrous to them, right? So we are, we are hoping that the next uh, NPR uh, uh, meeting will not bring up another increase right. in uh, interest rates. All right. Let me come back to the studio. Doc, I see you nodding to some of uh, his submissions. Yeah. He has talked about uh, that the president needs to declare a state of emergency in the agriculture sector. What, is, what do we stand to achieve with that? Well, um, well um, I've had this um, expression over and over again, but I tend to have a different um, you know, uh, way of looking at this issue because what, when we talk about declaring a state of emergency, what exactly are we aiming at? For me, what I think we should be looking at is this. It talked about sustainability, and I will take it up from there. Now, government is a continuum. And I expected if government of this country in the past, uh, say, 10, 15 years, had actually continued with some of the good programs that you know, the successive governments met on the ground, in agriculture in particular, we will not be talking about some of the problems we are talking about now. And um, because I recall between 2011 and 2015, there were some key interventions that were brought on board under the agricultural uh, development, uh, 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 excuse me, under the, um, the, um, the Jonathan administration, I need to be very specific, right. uh, where, you know, um, some interventions were brought, you know, uh, on board. And they were working well, but a change of government led to the jettisoning of those uh, interventions. And actually, it's like, you know, starting all over again. So successive governments should learn to take the good things, you know, uh, that they inherit from their predecessors. And that's what I would say there, talking about sustainability, because government policy, you know, flip-flop. Right. 
is also is a major problem, especially in this field of agriculture. All right, Doctor, we need to go on a break. And when we come back, we will continue this conversation. Okay. But I must also say that when we come back, this program continues on our other channels and on YouTube. Please stay with us. Doubt and fear doesn't occur at the canvas, it shows in the canvas. It shows the conation of raw other material slabs stroked and molded at a pace provided by the doubt and fear. Every move weigh in the struggle of one to the other, merging the past to the present, brush strokes of colors seen but not known, for when the wailing stops, the pieces settle down in abject beauty erected for a century of a century. Speaking advocating, protesting, as the arts are meant to be. Our planet, our home, threatened by man's activities, with fears of mass extinction on the rise. On Green Angle, we examine the issues that affect our environment, seek solutions to put us on track, to secure and restore a cleaner and greener world for generations to come. There is always more to a story than the scribbled line. The part of a story that is not told casts a shadow. It's like the part of an object that is not reached by light. On TVC News, I'm able to explore the many angles the rat was story, talking to stakeholders, asking the difficult questions, and digging for facts. I believe the viewers are able to make a better decision if they're well informed and understand not just the part, but the complete story. TVC News. First, with breaking news. I'm Mary Amlunge. I'm a passionate environment advocate and a published author. I am the founder of Celebration, a businesswoman, and... Welcome back to Politics Tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for staying with us. Tonight, our focus is on the moves federal government must work and all of that. But I, let me really ask you, have government interventions really worked in this country? Because at the moment, the federal government is talking about supplying small-scale processors and millions across the country. But how does government go about this, this time, in making sure that the common man benefits from this? Okay. So um, if we don't have the right diagnosis, we will not be able to make the right kind of intervention. So let's begin with that. Okay. So now... The issue of targeting the beneficiary is actually very pivotal here. And do we know those that are going to be beneficiaries of specific interventions? Um, the, the, the point that we need to make very clearly here, because I, like you pointed out, I was agreeing also with the, some of the things my colleague on the other end was saying, uh, particularly when it comes to issues around, um, you know, uh, what could cause dislocation, especially in the economy? Um, you talk about uh, you know whether government interventions have been working. Some have worked, but usually the problem is hijacking some some of these policies, especially you know for obvious reasons like uh, nepotism, like partisanship, and so many other things like that. But if we have a clear you know without data, without data we won't be able to properly implement any program mm. except we want to perform magic. And so we need to actually have reliable data. Do we Doc, talking about this data, I was having a conversation about database of farmers uh, benefiting from agricultural interventions of government with um, uh, Senator Abubakar Kiari, and he affirmed to the fact that this data is there, but it's corrupt and politicized. And I wonder what government, this administration should do about that. Okay, fine. If there are data on the ground, but corrupted and politicized. Mm -hmm. It is also the, uh, the, the work of those who are in office to try and clean the data up. I mean, there are so many different uh, parameters that you want to look at uh, that could probably make those uh, uh, data uh, um, not 
as useful as you would expect. Now, you have to work on all those things. For instance, if we talk about the database of farmers in Nigeria, in, in 2011 and 2015, I was trying to make mention, for instance, those who have grown old should be expunged. Those who are no longer in farming should be expunged. And then, of course, you cannot annually you can update this data. I'm talking about primary production now. I'm talking about farmers. Now, let's talk about what is imported. If you want to talk about food importation, now, there are about three angles that I would want us to look at. Now, one of them... You want, want us to look at? I want us to look at. I want us to actually examine. One of them is the problem of, you know, what is supposed to be a short-term intervention. Mm. Uh, the, the danger of it becoming, you know, uh, I mean, the danger of it now coming to stay like we've had with issues of uh, fuel subsidy, fertilizer subsidy, and all of those things. It, on, originally, they were meant to be you know, short term, and then they came to stay, for instance. And so if we are looking at uh, this 150 days uh, window, for instance, we may end up also creating cartel that may be very difficult to dislodge. Okay. And don't forget, we are in a, you know, in a political environment. So it is very likely some of those people that have political leverage might be those that would be at the forefront of those important. And so flooding the market, this is the second aspect I want to mention, flooding the market would crash prices, no doubt about that. To the benefit of consumers, yes, that would be okay. But producers, the local farmers, um, at the end of this uh, window, how does it impact on their own businesses? I mean, for instance, if what they are producing is not able to compete well with what has been imported because of you know price coming down and then their cost of production locally cannot be covered or recovered, then it would discourage them. So it is very, very likely that in the next production cycle, that's the next farming season, many would drop. There will be this cyclical uh, uh, glut, I mean, and then followed by scarcity. And, of course, a lot of people who have been discouraged might not come back into primary production. And since we are talking more about staples here, staples like rice, corn, you know, and some other, you know, grains like that, many who are involved in the production might not come back again. So the government has to be very granular in its approach to this. And that's where the issue of data comes in. And the government has to be very, very careful. There are a lot of uh, things to balance here. It's not just throwing the old door open, mm. you know, and then it would, we, we now congratulate ourselves that, oh, we are importing food massively. A lot of things will get into this country. And so we need to look at the critical control points, which, which is like those who are going to import, who are they? Are they actually stakeholders in agriculture or they're just emergency contractors or importers? Okay. So we need to look at those because, one, a lot of opportunism you know, would play up here. And so we need to look at that. And then we also need to look at the quality of what people will be bringing because at this point in time, a lot of people will import all manner of things. And I, will, I want to give a typical example. In 1999, during the time of um, the mad cow disease in, in, in Europe, one of my uh, professors, uh, it's late now, Professor Isuru Rosho, called me to his house in Ibadan and told me that a Nigerian in the diaspora wanted to be importing uh, the, the beef of animals that were condemned. He was actually trying to make a case. It, it was so ridiculous, but that was what the professor told me because he was one of our lecturers in public health. So he told me how far people can go. So you might find people who want to beat the system and bring food items that are not you know, good for consumption in terms of quality, maybe grains that have been stored for years that are so actually not good very, for human careful. consumption. So, so it's part of the quality, I mean, the, the critical control points we have to look at. And then the third part is this idea of how does it impact on our local farmers at the end of this window mm -hmm. so that they will, not be, they will not run them out of business. So we need to work on this. And then let me add this. We need to talk about subsidiarity. As the federal government is working on this, how are the states being carried along? Because one, it's not only a federal government show. It should be done, you know, in partnership with the states and even the local governments. Because one, as a matter of fact, federal government does not do agriculture. The federal government does not farm. It is in the states that farming is done. And so whatever we are trying to talk about here, without the state component, it's like, you know, we're just trying to do a macho uh, uh, program, which on the surface, might attract a lot of you know, positive attention, media-wise and all of those things, and then politicians will also use it you know, as um, you know, uh, political right. capital. But at the end of it all, 
it may not achieve the very purpose. And that's the reason why when we talk about this issue of uh, declaring state of emergency, I look at it, for me, it's, it's a loose expression. Mm -hmm. if, because if I want to go into details, so that's just the way I right. see it. Thank you, Doc. Let me go back to Mr. Mori. And let's talk about price, because there is also another uh, initiative, which is engagement with relevant stakeholders to set up uh, to set a GMP that is guarantee minimum price. This is what federal government had said. So, but I'm wondering, why has there been so much argument on whether or not price control will work for us? Well, because first of all, we're a free market economy. Um, government does not have a, an active role um, to determine price. Um, so that, that, that in itself is there. Right, but like I said, and I would, I would I would give a bit of context to when I say declare state of emergency. Um, when you look at the concept of having a state of emergency, it means that you cannot it, it can no longer be business as usual. You have to make take active steps to either stop something or um, implement certain strategies to rejig a system and restore it or stop it from bleeding. Our agri sector is not producing enough. Our farms are being raided, suffering from flooding, challenges. Indigenous farmers cannot assess credit. Um, so essentially our production for, for sustenance, not even for up, um, exports, is at, is at an all-time low. And so you cannot approach such challenges Typically, you've got to take active steps. That means do things differently. If you need to give waivers, give waivers. If you need to crash credit, crash credit. If you need to um, infuse funding, if you need to send in security, if you need to make, give certain executive orders or bypass certain um, uh, bottlenecks in order to speed up production, that must be done. And in a democracy, there is a bureaucratic system of doing things. But as we are today, the agri sector cannot afford to follow through on that bureaucracy. And that's why we are having this waiver. That's why we now, like Doctor has said, need to look at indigenous farmers. Indigenous production is, an, is, a, is dangerously at an all-time low. And so when I say declare a state of emergency, I'm saying we need to stop the bleeding. By all means, we need to begin to give life. We need to rejig. We cannot be starving or having food insecurities and issues like irrigation, issues like water is preventing us from having bounteous habits when we could have in, in deployed certain strategies. Um, so um, I will still maintain that government needs to do things differently in the agri sector. Government needs to look um, we have a short-term, mid-term, and long-term approach to agricultural challenges. Regarding pricing, one of the things I have maintained is that government must now actively work with the associations that regulate um, markets, right? And it will, it will shock you that price control in the informal sector is actually done very fast, very swiftly, and in a very coordinated manner. So if you go to a market in Isaleko um, for, to buy a cup of rice, and they tell you it has gone up to five naira, if you go to the same market in Abulegba, you'll be shocked that it will be the same price. How have they disseminated in this information? They have an informal system that operates. Government must now sit down with this informal system, with the uh, lodgers, with the market unions, with the market associations, discuss their challenges and fix some of these challenges um, with a view to getting them to bring their prices down. Then another key thing that affects our prices is the logistic supply chain, right? If we, we are looking at uh, export importation now, we must also look at that logistic supply chain. How does food go from the hot, uh, the food beds to the um, uh, commercial hot spots, right? Um, and how do you ensure that the pricing of that logistic is brought down to a very decent minimum? 
that's one way where government can actively help to shoot down prices. Government cannot unilaterally decide that, oh, this is going to be, the, you cannot sell beyond this. Because every businessman will tell you what their operational cost is and what their landing cost is. Now, the only way government will have a solid say in determining price is where it actively shows its involvement in bringing down these operational costs as it can. Logistic supply chain, fix it. Sit down with the informal sector, address their indigenous challenges, fix it. Ensure that we have um, the adequate support to the farming areas, like what are the things that they need. As a lot of them have storage challenges. You'll be shocked to see that yam is 5,000, 10,000 naira in Lagos, and then the tubers of yam, bands of yam are rotting up in these places because they do not have adequate storage and because there is a timeline between when the first truck comes to pick yam and takes to Lagos and when the second one comes. And in between that time, you start seeing damage. Now, what needs to be done? So it's, it's, it's a, it's a multi-level approach. And then the federal government cannot act, you see, one of the challenges we've continued to have, and I think this is something that politics has played a very dangerous role in creating, is each level of government working in silos. We can't afford that now. There has to be a synergized approach to this challenge. The federal, the state, and the local government. I thank God that the local government is being rejected now, thanks to the Supreme Court decision. So every um, um, level of government must work actively together. The local government plays a pivotal role. In fact, constitutionally, the local government has the constitutional powers to regulate and manage markets. Mm. This so let me come in there, Mr. Mori, because, I mean, Doc yeah. has talked about the need for federal government to carry state governments along, and you've also mm. talked about indigenous farming. And I remember that uh, in June, June or July, the federal government asked, was asking for collaboration with state governors to identify irrigable, irrigable lands and increased land under cultivation in their various states. But since then, we've seen uh, low commitment from, from, from state governments. Would you also blame federal government for that? So, this really is not about blaming anybody. Mm. It's about us realizing that we will go hungry, irrespective of where, what level you are. I always say there's no place called federal government. Even the federal government is in a place that is, is designated more like a state, the FCT. And states play a very pivotal role. Go federal government has its own power. So, the question is very clear. And as um, said, the issue is that we don't the the, 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 the the penchant of accountability is not held uh, properly across the three sides of the divide. There's so much fixation on the federal government and very little on the state and local government. And so that responsibility falls both on the federal government and on the citizenry, right? Um, if the government is saying to states, provide with this, and the states are dragging their feet, what are the people doing? Are they able to, you know, dialogue with their governors? Are they able to get their governors to do these things, right? Um, all that belief that the federal government is almighty really is a myth and a very dangerous myth. Mm. We've got a state government, we've got local government that are receiving revenue from the constitution accounts. These monies must be deployed to certain things. So when it comes to agriculture, they play a pivotal role. I've just said to you that local governments have a, a very important role to play in markets. Market regulation, in fact, to prevent price gogging. Each market is supposed to have a market manager appointed mm -hmm. by the local government. Now, what has happened is that these positions have become non, non-existent. And so what you now have are the individual market unions becoming lords unto themselves with very little supervisory control. This was not the contemplation of the law. So we must return this this back to status quo, where you have a system in place that regulates the activities and um, dialogues with them to ensure that there's not no indiscriminate price gogging. One of the things that we have faced of recent with the inflation have been very dangerous and inhuman price gogging as a result of the capi individual uh, capitalization on the economic challenges. And so somebody wakes up today and you walk into a shop to say, how much is this? And they tell you it's 10 naira. And then you go out to use the POS and come back, but they tell you it's now 15 naira. And before you make up your mind and go down and come back, and they tell you it's 20 naira. It's happening. People have seen it happen. All right. Right? 
And, and that's because the regulatory oversight is on, a, is on, a, is on an all-time low. So we've got to now do that, right? Um, if you cannot just wake up and tell people how much to sell, but you can put in place measures to prevent them from having excuses to guard their prices and raise it indiscriminately. All right, then. So the federal government must play their role. The state government must play its role. The local government must actively be present and play its role if we're serious about, you know, um, managing prices. All right, let me come back to Doc, uh, and let's bring this conversation back to the Southwest, because I remember the Southwest governors met and agreed to strengthen farm security. They, they met and planned um, massive land clearing, uh, and according to them, it's untrue that the region has lost its capacity to produce uh, its food. And I wonder why some of your colleagues say this is mere political statement. But from your own findings as a business, uh, as an agribusiness analyst, what... Um, have you seen any level of commitment to back up this statement? Well, um, well uh, let me start this way. Uh, shortly after the COVID-19 lockdown, there were talks about the uh, various state uh, uh, commissioners meeting and trying to uh, see how to ramp up food production. Um, I didn't really see much coming out of it. And all the states that are involved are also in this uh, Dawn Commission. So I wouldn't know whether right now they are prepared to do things differently since there are different administrations, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, commissioners on board and all of that. So I would not be able to tell at this point in time their level of commitment beyond the fact that, yes, of course, meetings were held and then some, you know, points, you know, are raised and stuff like that. But I will say this before I continue because I need to emphasize. Yes, I actually agree with my colleague uh, who said, who, I mean, some of the things he mentioned and all of that, uh, actually, I see, I see them the same way. And my point about um, uh, um, when we talk about state of emergency, in the context in which he put it, I agree with him in entirety. Now, I need to say this coming back to your uh, question, that Part of what we need to do, when you bring about the uh, issue of uh, the Down Commission and the Southwest uh, Governors and uh, Commissioners and, and, and all that, I would say, and I've said it in this studio about two years ago, that there's a need for us to actually, as a country, to have what I would call specialization in the area of agriculture. And, of course, division of labor, I would also say that the crops that are, you know, uh, that uh, specific agroecological zones have our comparative advantages in producing should be emphasized. Like in the Southwest, for instance, tuber crops and root crops are actually are areas of strength. And then, of course, you think about things like banana and plantain and, and, you know, as also uh, areas of strength among the various staples that we consume. Another one is corn. And these are the things that we need to be looking at. And then we can talk about the northern part of the country that are, especially when you go to the uh, far north, they are mostly, uh, their area of strength is actually mostly grains. The middle belt, yes, a mixture of both, like Benue, for instance, you know, uh, can produce a lot of tubers in addition to uh, grains. So these are the things I expect Don Commission to be looking at. And then in talking about it, now agriculture is seasonal. And you have also you have the, the rainy season, you have the dry season. What plans are they having? Now that the rainy season for this year had come the way it has come, what are we trying to do to make sure we make use of the dry season that is ahead of us? Those are the kinds of things we would like to be hearing from them. I do not say as a person that is mere politics because I know that having been within the system sometimes in the past, I know, you know, how things operate. And then, of course, I can say that, um, you know, whatever... When you say how things operate, what do you mean? You start with ideas mm -hmm. and then you, 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 you think through about operational uh, plan. And then, of course, how do you deploy men and capital. So are there know. challenges in achieving that? Oh, oh it, there's always a challenge. And that brings us back to what my colleague and myself had mentioned in the past. We need to really, and this is where I will now use the expression of state emergency, not only at the federal level, even at the state level too, within this context, we should then look at I also talked about the critical control point, areas where things can go wrong, the leakages, which you block the leakages, and then we should make sure we do this with sense of responsibility because governance is about, you know, uh, 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 the people. It's not about individuals that are within the system. And so then there should be a focus and there should be 
goals that will be set as to production, for instance. For each of these uh, key crops, what do we want to achieve? And how do we want to set about achieving? What will be the constraint? And how do we overcome them? So these are some of the things we need to actually begin to put in place. So I very much believe that uh, by the time the Dawn Commission will make known what their plans and their programs are, we'll have reasons to know, you know where they're heading and what expectations to have of them. All right, Mr. Murray, let me come to you. I know you've said a lot tonight, but I mean, as we wrap up, what more can government do for us as a nation to achieve food security? Well, um, access to finance is very important for indigenous production. Um, manufacturers are crying out that access to credit is becoming um, a lot more um, heavy for them to carry. And so government must now look at that challenge and fix it. Um, so, and then work more intently with the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Um, Sweden needs to do a lot more to help um, small and medium scale businesses. And then throw open um, arable land. There's so much land that's um, underutilized. Uh, 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 Agri sector has enormous potential, but there's so much underutilization, right? So government must now incentivize farming um, beyond just farming um, in, in, in your backyard or that little form of farming, but to help investors, help startups, help businesses work actively in the agri-tech space, right? And then technology. So we... we we seem not to have gotten it right with deploying technology and innovation in our agri-tech, in our agricultural sector. And until we do that, we will continue to um, suffer the challenges that we presently suffer, right? Um, like doctor has said, you, you prepare during the rainy season for the dry season. And I oh. don't see any concerted effort, you know, by government and by agencies of government to do that. And so let's deploy technology All right. to prepare for the for the for the dry days, you know, not rainy days now, but when, when the season is dry. All so right. that on the rainy day, you know, when push comes to shove, we're able to sustainably cater to All ourselves. All right, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your perspective tonight. And I hope that government takes into cognizance some of your recommendations tonight in addressing food inflation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Luka Edo Yileye, and a great business uh, analyst, and Omori Edo Gauri, a startup business uh, lawyer and a financial analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. And thank you for thank watching, you. everyone. That marks the end of today's episode of Politics Tonight. But you can watch the repeat broadcast of this episode at midnight. Get in touch with us on our social media handles, Facebook, Instagram, and X, at TDC News NG, and at Olajibokia W using the hashtag Politics Tonight. We're also on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TDC News Nigeria. I am Olajibokia Olatunji. Good night, everyone.